So I'm going to give an overview of quantum networking. This is something that uh, Dowling and I both had a very fond interest in. And it primarily started uh, with our joint collaborations with uh, Jan Wai Pan's group in China. I'm sure, and this thing doesn't work. There we go. Uh, so you've all seen this picture uh, from their group, very famous experiment where they put up a low Earth orbit satellite and distributed some entangled photons over, over a thousand kilometers between base stations on the ground. And Zi Xin and I were uh, lucky enough to be in China while they were prototyping this experiment. This is us standing in front of the, the one that didn't go to space, the ground-based uh, prototype of the experiment that went to space. And all of that complex machinery, all it does is spits out HV plus VH bell pairs, polarization entangled bell pairs, which, uh, which they do quantum key distribution with, because that's one of the few things you can do with bell pairs alone without quantum memory or anything else like that. So that's what it's all being used for. But where am I going to point this thing to? Back, back, next, next. Here we are. So China has actually done a lot more than just this satellite that is the experiment that gets the most attention. They've actually got an entire, what they call a quantum backbone, connecting many cities in China and within various cities, some local area networks. Um, now, lots of people see these pictures and the language around it and come to the conclusion that this is a quantum internet, which it isn't, and I'll explain why. It's actually what they call a trusted node quantum key distribution network. All of these individual nodes, whether it be the ones in the city or the ones connecting cities, they don't have the ability to relay quantum information. They only have the ability to measure and to prepare new states. So if you imagine that you're trying to talk to this guy and you're standing up here, then what's the quantum channel between you uh, it's guys that are measuring your state and re-preparing it. So it's implementing a perfect dephasing channel, and it's easy to see that that doesn't have a lot of utility for quantum applications when everything just gets measured and uh, you don't preserve any quantum information. So this particular type of construction for the network, it really only has one particular use, and that's for what they call trusted node quantum key distribution. And it's called trusted nodes because if I want to share a quantum key between this node and this node, I have to trust that all of these ones in the middle are secure. What they're doing is from one edge to the next, uh, doing quantum key distribution. At that node, the key gets measured and then retransmitted. And you have to trust those nodes because if any, any of them gets compromised, the entire length gets compromised. So it's not a pure quantum network. It's a sort of pseudo quantum network where you only actually get quantum information between nearest neighbor nodes and nothing beyond that. So they, they, you can play a lot of games with, uh, with this alone, even though it's not a quantum network. Um, you, you'll see an immediate vulnerability here in that the security of this network drops exponentially with the number of nodes between you. If you've got some probability that a given node is going to be compromised and you require that none of the nodes get compromised in between, then you've got exponentially deteriorating security with the length of, 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 the, of the chain that you're communicating through. Um, so, but you can uh, work around that, incidentally, using more nodes rather than fewer, but by using them in parallel rather than in series. So if we consider uh, one trusted node link like this, here I have to trust that this guy doesn't get compromised. But what we can do is use multiple independent paths through the network and then combine all the keys at the end. So I use this path to communicate a key, this path and this path, and at the end, I create a master key given by combining all of the keys together using an exclusive OR operation. And what that means is that that master key has the property that it can only be known if every single contributing key was known. So now we have a situation where the security is exponentially improving as we use more, uh, more routes in parallel rather than in series. But that's about as much gameplay as you can play with this uh, type of construction. What we're really interested in is a network that relays quantum information, doesn't do uh, an intercept resend attack in the middle, but actually relays end-to-end -end entanglement. Because in a quantum network, we think about everything in terms of entanglement being a as a resource. And the reason we do that is because if you have bell pairs between end-to-end -end points, that's a, a universal resource for quantum communication. You can use quantum state teleportation with it, uh, communicated bell pair 
to teleport a quantum state from one side to the other. Why do we want to do that in a quantum network? Well, the reason is that the no cloning theorem tells us that if I give you a generic qubit that encodes some information and I lose it along the network, I can't make a second copy of it. We can't just duplicate quantum information. So if I've got a big lossy optical fiber and I'm sending single photons down, with high probability they're going to get lost and our information is lost and can't be recreated. So we shift the problem into a state teleportation problem. We, we transmit bell pairs as often as we can and repeat until success. When we get a bell pair that's successfully communicated by the endpoints, then we use quantum state teleportation to complete the protocol. That's what we're aiming for with the quantum network and why this previous network is not really a quantum network because it doesn't have us give us the ability to communicate quantum information via teleportation between arbitrary points. Uh, so how do we get there? What, what do we need to add to the experiments that the, and the infrastructure that they've already got in place? What do we need to add to give it this kind of functionality that I'm talking about such that you can get end-to-end -end entanglement links? Well, what you need to do is introduce two new ingredients. You need entanglement swapping and entanglement purification because those two things allow us to get arbitrarily high quality bell pairs over arbitrarily long distances in a way which is still efficient in resource usage. So entanglement swapping, whoops, the idea is back, back. Thank you. So, no. Uh, Thank you. So the idea of um, entanglement swapping is you start with two bell pairs and you do, do a joint bell measurement on one half of each bell pair. And what you're left with is a bell pair between the ends. So if you have a whole bunch of links that communicate bell pairs, you do this intermittently between them and you extend the range of bell pairs. The other thing we need to address is the quality of the bell pairs that we're communicating. We can improve that using, uh, using purification. So here's a simple optical purification experiment. This is one was demonstrated by Jun Wai Pan many years ago. And all it uses is two polarizing beam splitters to boost the fidelity of these two bell pairs into one that has higher fidelity than either of the initial two that we started with. And you can explain how this works quite easily with this experiment. These polarizing beam splitters have the property that they transmit horizontally polarized light and they reflect a vertically polarized light. So if I've got two input modes, two polarization encoded qubits, if they have matching parity, what that means is that I'll observe a coincidence at the output to the, uh, to the beam splitter. If they're both horizontal, they both reflect. If they're both vertical, they both transmit. I get a coincidence that way. If they have mismatched parity, one is a zero and the other one is one, then you observe bunching and you see two photons coming out one port. So if we post-select for both of these beam splitters on detecting a coincidence at the output, then what that means is that I've done two parity measurements. So if you've got two bell pairs with a single bit flip on one of them, you'll be able to filter that out. You'll know that there's a mismatch in the parity because one of those parity projections will fail and say odd parity. You throw that away, you repeat it. When it succeeds, then what you've done is you've filtered out the case where a single bit flip has occurred. So with these two ingredients, we can boost the quality of, ent of entangled pairs between endpoints. We can also, also extend the range. And that gives us what's called a quantum repeater network. And once we have that in place, then we've got end-to-end -end entanglement links that we can use as a uni universal resource for any other sort of quantum communication via teleportation. So what's the real long-term goal with all of this? All we've talked about is quantum key distribution. And I know that this is a, a polarizing topic, but I'm actually very critical of QKD. I don't think it's a very exciting thing to do, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, firstly, it seems likely that in the near future, we're going to have standardized post-quantum cryptography, which gives us a whole suite of cryptographic algorithms for public key signatures, public key encryption, hash functions, everything is post-quantum now and, and secure against algorithms like Shaw's algorithm. Uh, the, other, the other reason that uh, QKD is not so exciting is because it has very limited utility. Uh, in that network, it only guarantees uh, in, uh, secure keys between those nodes. As soon as you leave one of those nodes, you inevitably have to go back to classical encryption techniques. So this is something that might have 
limited utility in, in government applications where you know, you've got embassies connecting each other, but it can't possibly find its way into your mobile phone or onto your server or into your laptop. Because uh, as soon as it leaves that trusted node, it has to switch over to use classical encryption. Yeah? Oh, well, I'm sure he would be. Uh, I'm sure he would be, but he's been wrong on other things before. And we've got, we've got an entire session dedicated to exposing the things where he was wrong. Uh, so, we, so we can add that to the list. This is, this is the real interesting application for a quantum network, which is joining together quantum computers in the future where quantum computers are uh, ubiquitous and, and widely used. Why is that a particularly interesting thing to do to join quantum computers? Well, it's because the, the computational power of a quantum computer is super linear in the number of qubits that belong to it. So if you've got two quantum computers acting independently, you effectively sum their computational power. If you're able to unify them together so that they act as one coherent device, you can super linearly potentially exponentially boost the, the, the computational power coming out of it. So you, you get something greater than the sum of the parts when you unify two quantum computers in a way that allows them to act as a single larger quantum computer. So we'll have a look at how we can do that. The easiest way to think about this is in the cluster, is in the cluster state model where we've got graph states as a resource for universal quantum computing. And you can just think of it uh, as a simple patchwork time, type of problem. If I've got a, a single node with, which, with access to a lattice cluster state of a given dimension, that dimension is what determines the size and the depth of the computation that we're able to implement with it. If we've got quantum commu communications links between multiple nodes, we can patchwork them together to make a dis distributed cluster state, which is much larger than what any of the individual ones are able to do on their own. And so this is one way of thinking about a toy model for building, building a distributed quantum computer. We start with little patchworks of cluster states given by the size of the respective quantum computers, and we unify them into a distributed graph state that enables a substrate for a much larger computation. Okay, so how do we build graph states then to, to implement on our quantum computer? This is the normal way that people think about etching uh, quantum computations onto graph states. They start with their quantum circuit, overlay it on top of a, a lattice graph state and just etch out the bits you don't need. That's the easy way to see that cluster states are universal for quantum computing. But this isn't the most efficient way to do it. You can see that to go from that little circuit there, mapping it on a lattice cluster down to this circuit here, there's a lot of wastage. We're wasting a lot of qubits. There's lots of unnecessary stuff and it's not very resource efficient. So that's a sort of destructive way to build a, a, a graph state. You start with a large substrate and then you etch it down to size. The other way you can do it is constructively. And this is something that we recently uh, developed some software packages for automating that pipeline. Um, if, you, if you think of, uh, well, there are, there are different sorts of constructions you can use for building quantum circuits. And we used one called the ICM model which effectively allows you to drag all of the Clifford operations within a quantum circuit up to the front. They're acting on the initial state. So that big Clifford part can be treated as a state preparation part. And then you're doing some measurements and feed forwards and some final touches on that state. So let's think about that resource state. We've got some, some initial state, a big set of Clifford operations acting on it, which is CNOTs, CZs, Hadamards, things like that. At the end of that, we've got a big Clifford state. We want to convert that to a graph state. So a graph state can be represent is also a Clifford state, um, but it has the particular property that it has a stabilizer given by an X for every qubit, has an X on it, and Zs on its local neighborhood graph. So we need to get our, our stabilizers for our general Clifford state that we've prepared, prepared and convert it into that form, into the specific structure that a graph state has. There's a, there's a very simple algorithm for doing this, um, which is a modification of a Gaussian elimination protocol. And that's what we've implemented here. So this graph state here is using this I, ICM construction, pulling everything Clifford to the front, compiling it and converting it under local operations into this graph state. And then you do a few uh, op, uh, measurements on this, and this implements a Toffoli gate. So this is the, the constructive way to build a Toffoli gate in the graph state picture. 
This is sort of the destructive way that you etch uh, uh, in a far less efficient way, a circuit into a, gra into a graph state. So we're focusing on this just because it is much more efficient in its utilization. And you can play lots of tricks on this as well. Graph states have all sorts of interesting properties that using local operations, you can do local edge complementations. So you can complement the, the subgraph that's given by the neighborhood of a given vertex using just local operations. This gives you a graph state that's locally equivalent, but uh, has a completely different graph structure. So that gives us a degree of freedom that we can optimize over to, for example, minimize edges. And once we've got a big graph state representing a, a computation that we'd like to implement in a distributed way, we now have some very unique ways of thinking about scheduling, which are very different to scheduling on classical supercomputers where we usually just uh, timeshare processes. Here, we're thinking about things a little bit differently. Suppose we've got this big graph state here and I want to partition that across a distributed network. Let's imagine that these colors represent different nodes that I've allocated these qubits to. Then what we're left with is a sort of clustering problem. This is an idea that was sought up by Hudson Leon, a PhD student uh, who's here today. So imagine that each of these big circles represents a quantum node. Within it are the qubits within that node. And here I've just assigned different qubits to different nodes and preserved all the edges between the qubits. So these are exactly the same computations as here I've, I've scheduled it to a quantum computer. And so what this does is it turns scheduling into a constrained optimization problem whereby you have some number of qubits, you need to allocate them to nodes such that uh, no node exceeds its number of qubits. And our goal is to minimize the total number of edges. They're gonna be the expensive part in a quantum network is the long distance edges, not the short distance ones within a node. So this is a mathematical construction that's equivalent to, to scheduling that we use in, in, in classical networks, but the way we're thinking about it is completely differently. Okay, so we've got all of that in place. That then naturally leads to the idea of cloud quantum computing, where the average layman like me, I don't have the ability to afford a quantum computer. I never will. I'm going to access it through the cloud. That's how most people are going to do it using a client server sort of um, uh, model. Now, if you're going to be outsourcing valuable computations, and with quantum computing, we are necessarily talking about valuable computations, whether it be for IP reasons or national security or whatever the case may be, we want to, when we outsource something, be quite secure about it. We don't want the person who's doing the calculation to take all our data while they're processing it and keep it for themselves. So how can we do that? In the classical world, we really rely on trust when we do that. When you upload something to a supercomputer, you just have to take for granted that they're not going to steal all your data. But we can actually do a lot better than that in the quantum scenario using two types of encryption. One's called homomorphic encryption and the other one is called blind quantum computing. And they're both very similar in the sense that uh, what they allow you to do is outsource a computation in a way that it is processed in encrypted form without being first decrypted. And I'll explain a toy model that shows how that idea works. Suppose I've got just a Clifford uh, circuit. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute because obviously Clifford is quite limited. But imagine we want to securely outsource this particular Clifford circuit here uh, on these input qubits. If I want to homomorphically encrypt that so that someone intercepting it can't read my data, there's a very simple way to do that. What I do is for every input qubit is I randomly choose one of the Pauli operations, I, X, Y, or Z, and with one quarter probability apply one of those operations. So if you don't know uh, what Pauli was chosen, then what you perceive is one quarter probability of I, X, Y, or Z. That gives you a perfectly polarizing channel which gives you a completely mixed state and carries no information about the state that you are working with. If you do know what the choice of key is, then after the computation, you can easily undo it because the property that Clifford circuits have with Pauli operators is that Pauli operators commute through Clifford circuits to give you a different set of Pauli operators. Yeah? Well, I've chosen the Clifford group because it has the property that the Pauli operators propagate through it. I'll come back to loosening that generalization in a second. 
but it's really this property here that they commute through and you can efficiently calculate what it is when it commutes through, okay? So that part can be done classically. So Alice is going to encrypt like this. She knows how to decrypt by commuting the key through and she can undo it. But Bob, at any point here, all he sees is a completely mixed state and can't extract anything. So this gives us information theoretic security on implementing these Clifford groups. So Clifford groups also, it turns out that uh, they can be efficiently classically simulated. So they're not actually that interesting from, from a, a quantum advantage perspective, but you can use some tricks here. Um, if you add T gates to uh, the Clifford operations, then you become universal. So how can we implement a T gate without violating this whole construction? Well, the other way to do T gates is by injecting magic states and using teleportation to effectively teleport the action of a, of, a, of a T gate using a magic state as a resource. So we add some extra lines down here with all the T gates we need, one for every, uh, sorry, sort of magic states down here, one for every T gate that we want implemented here. And then we've just got some extra states, but all of this remains Clifford because the teleportation circuitry is Clifford as well. So we can remain consistent with this and achieve universality now. And keeping in mind, this gives us information theoretic security. There's nothing that can be done to violate this. Now, this type of encryption um, isn't really available to us classically. Homomorphic encryption has been described for classical computing, but it has very, very significant overheads. And that's the reason that it just isn't worth doing it uh, for, for most practical intents and purposes. There's a, a further generalization of this called blind quantum computing where the client is both encrypting the data and the algorithm itself. So the client can upload an encrypted data and encrypted description of the algorithm. Bob is able to implement and execute all of that without learning anything about the algorithm or the data. And that's something that isn't even theoretically possible in case, in fact, there's a no-go proof in the classical context that you can't do this. So this is a, a uniquely quantum type of encryption and uh, people like Joe Fitzsimons in particular have done a lot of work on this, looking at it in the cluster state model. Um, but this is going to be an essential ingredient if we're going to have an outsourced model for, for quantum computing. Okay, so what about the incentives for doing all this? Uh, we, we know that if we join quantum computers together, we can get something more powerful than the sum of the parts if they're connected by quantum channels. So that, that leads us to some indications of what the economic incentives are. If you've got classical CPUs and you've got the number of them on this axis, then the computational power is just linear in the number of CPUs you have. That's our standard everyday result. If we've got quantum processing units, but they're acting independently just with classical communication, you also get a linear curve. It's just the sum of the parts. It's specifically when we unify quantum processing units into a single larger one, that we get this exponential uh, curve here. And it's this, the difference between this and this is what gives us our return on investment if we take our quantum processing units and add quantum communication between them. Okay, so if we've got independent quantum processing units, we've got linear scaling in the return, the computational return we get. If we unify them with a quantum network, it becomes exponential. The difference between there is effectively the return on investment that you get from building the network that unifies them together. And obviously that gap is a very big one. It's a difference between an exponential and a linear curve. So we know that if and when this technology exists, one thing is for certain, there's a good market incentive to want to connect quantum computers, assuming they're able, they're compatible and they're able to interconnect. So this leads to some interesting political considerations in the long term. If we, if we live in a future where there are quantum computers all over the world and people are networking them together, what does that lead to in terms of some game theoretic considerations? Well, the first uh, obvious result is that if you have a network of quantum computers, the optimal thing game theoretically anyone can do is contribute uh, their compute resources to the network and then everybody time shares the cumulative uh, power because time sharing is just you know you just divide things linearly by the number of participants but everything that gets contributed is is compounding exponentially um, so from a, from a pure return on investment calculated in terms of 
computational power, the best thing everybody can do is unify. However, it may be the case that you decide that what other people are doing with that computational power may not be to your liking. Imagine we've got two superpower states and they're just sitting at the threshold whereby their quantum computers are not quite large enough on their own to crack one another's codes, for example. And then they both have to make the decision, are we going to unify? Well, sure, they'd both be better off in terms of raw computational power, but one side might very well say, I'd prefer it if they didn't have the ability to implement that algorithm. That could be a huge detriment to me. So what I would anticipate is in, in the future where we have lots of quantum computers and quantum networks, there will be lots of diplomatic considerations in how they're rolled out. And probably these things will grow along geostrategic boundaries. It seems unlikely that, for example, two competing superpowers would unify their quantum computers together and in effect allow the opposition to have technology that can be used against them. So um, here's, a, here's a, a, a hypothetical scenario from my book that I, that I concocted. So we imagine a Russian bedroom hacker with no direct access to quantum technology delegates a factorization algorithm to the cloud using homomorphic encryption. It's physically executed in the United States, returned to the Russian guy, and he uses it to break Hillary's emails or something like that and swings the election in favor of Trump. That's not technically impossible under this, under this type of model where quantum computing is available in the cloud. And it illustrates very well why the president may not like the fact that other people uh, are, are unifying with his quantum computing because it can some advantage. So I think I'm running out of time. So on, oh, cool. So, oh, crap. <laughs> he always enters the stage uninvited, just when you don't yeah. want. And he doesn't take the hint either. So this is my overview of, of how I foresee a future global sort of networked ecosystem working. Um, at the base level, different people have quantum computers. We have international links connecting them together, which could be fiber links. It could be satellite links like what the Chinese are doing. Uh, another one that I haven't really talked about is the idea of a quantum sneaker net. This is developed by uh, Simon, ben, uh, Simon Devitt at UTS. And the idea here is that uh, with bell pairs, unlike classical data, there's no concern of latency associated with bell pairs. They're all identical. Um, and so they're infinitely re reproducible, identical, and simultaneously act as a universal resource for quantum communication. What that means is you can store them and use them later. If they don't have to arrive at the time when you want to actually communicate your quantum data. And so Simon came up with this idea. You might remember those of you who, who ever did like computer systems engineering or something, your, your lecturer would say, the highest bandwidth we can get classically is to fill a truck full of CDs and ship it down the highway. It gives you very, very high bandwidth, but of course, very, uh, very poor latency. You can't actually use it for anything except watch movies. But in the quantum context, it's different. We could take that same model, pack a ship full of he heavily error-protected uh, uh, entangled pairs or half of error-corrected entangled pairs and just ship them uh, high bandwidth, high latency, but we don't care about the latency. All we care about is that we've got bell pairs at the end. And Simon's done lots of calculations on this showing that it's viable. So this is another thing we can add to the mix. With all of that at our disposal, then people can erect homomorphic encryption barriers and outsource computation to this un universal cloud that everybody is contributing to. And we would imagine that it might be mediated by some kind of international market in the same way that, that normal bandwidth has a value on the market. We would imagine that bell pairs would have a value on the market. And uh, one thing is for certain, although we don't know the value of bell pairs are gonna be much more expensive than classical bits. Uh, hence the need for all these uh, scheduling algorithms and that kind of thing. So this is sort of the vision. This is this is this is Zi Xin's work up here, the, the telescopy kind of stuff as well, which we talked about with John. But this is the big vision that we have: uh, an era where quantum communications provides end-to-end -end entanglement links between arbitrary points on Earth, which you can use as a universal resource for teleporting quantum information. We can forget about QKD and focus more on the era of quantum computing, where we're saying, who do we connect to next? 
and by what factor is that going to increase my own computational power by allowing myself to unify with others? So we can imagine a very, very greedy system emerging where you just desperately want to plug into everyone so that you can accumulate as much computational power as possible. Um, that leads to the final slide. Uh, this, is, this is a book, Zixin is a contributor. I think there are some other contributors here as well. Uh, and uh, I'll open it up to questions at that point or discussion or whatever. Lewis? Oh, Peter, actually, for the people online, can you just repeat the questions that are asked? Uh, yeah, so the question was, you, you can't obscure the size of the computation. Uh, that, that's true. I mean, you can always try and pad it, for example, to, to obscure things that way. It's, it's exactly the same uh, criticism that applies to quantum key distribution. You can obscure everything except the length of a message. Um, and of course, uh, if it's a military command and uh, the, the only two orders are yes and no, then uh, that can make all the difference. Uh, so you, yeah, you start petter padding things to fix size packets or whatever. You play the same tricks here, but yes, you're right. You don't obscure that in particular. Yep. Well, okay, so let's think of it in two ways. You can either have the number of qubits involved in the computation or the circuit depth. Let's use those two metrics. So if we're mapping that to say a lattice graph state, then they correspond to the X and Y dimensions of the lattice respectively. So depending upon how you tile together those different lattices, you could either have a bigger computation for a given circuit depth, or you could have a greater circuit depth for a given number of qubits involved in the computation or some combination of those. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so I'll give you like an easy guess. So most of the questions you see are going to be like that question. Take advantage of that whole thing as a larger uh, architecture model. Do you know the question that you want to answer? Oh, sure. Okay, so it's not I, I'm assuming classical information comes for free. Um, and, and everybody can happily classically communicate. But yes, you're absolutely right. There needs to be that. Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andrew? Mm. Yeah. So I suppose like one component of this is like what uh yeah, look okay, so there are different generations of quantum repeaters. I've described the, the simplest generation where all you've got is tanglement swapping and purification. And yes, that can in principle um, with polynomial overheads get you arbitrary length. So the, the length that you go, the resources you need in time to scale polynomially with that. Um, how that will turn out in practice is hard to know because the, the really futuristic way of thinking about quantum repeater networks is not single qubits that you're purifying and, 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 and entanglement swapping, but instead you start with a big bucket of of bell pairs and you put them in a highly error protected state and, and transmit the entire error correcting code, right? That, that's the better way to do it. I don't know what the resource estimates on that are, um, but one thing is for certain is that bandwidths are very low by comparison to, to classical technology. Like that, that satellite, each of the atmospheric uh, paths that you go through has about 40 decibels of loss. So you've got 80 decibels in total, which is a factor of 100 million, which means that um, what, what was originally like a gigahertz or 100 mega, megahertz repetition rate on the source ends up being on the order of hertz by the time it reaches the ground. Now that's in particular because atmospheric losses can't be avoided. If you do things through fiber, it'd be better in that respect. Um, 
it's still difficult to know what, what bandwidth or resource requirements to expect because these things are highly tuned to what the physical loss parameters are in all the different places that it can occur. Uh, I don't have any expectation for, for what bandwidths or anything to expect from this. A matter of? Well, I mean, that, that's another thing you, you could do. You could have nodes in space, but I, I mean, I don't know why you would. I mean, I, you might as well just keep them on the ground. <laughs> I mean, it's possible, yeah. Well, you could do that. Uh, you also avoid the atmospheric loss if you just stay on the ground. Uh, so, so I don't really know the answer. You are? Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of trade offs here. Um, and I guess it, it's difficult to, to take any guesses. Uh, I, I, I think really it depends on what the outcomes of the engineering characteristics are. They're, they're what dictate these trade-offs, is what, what the physical loss rates are that determines what the resource overhead is. And sure, we can quote what, where those figures are today, but that's not going to be representative of where it will be when this stuff is being rolled out on a large scale. You had a question? Oh, no, not necessarily at all. Um, in, if you're thinking of this toy model based on lattices, it's really just the edges that need to be able to, to create new links to the edges of the neighboring patchwork. It's definitely not an all to all kind of uh, network. Narande? I don't actually know what horizontal scalability and vertical scalability are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't know whether this exactly answers the question, but but one model for for building um, large scale quantum computers is very similar to this patchwork idea I described. You imagine little boxes or whatever size they are that are mass produced. They all contain some uh, sur surface code or, or, or cluster state of a given dimension. And then they connect with optical interconnects to other, other ones and you end up with a whole rack of these. That, that's sort of one way you could think about building a quantum computer to begin with. I don't know whether that's exactly the same as this horizontal scalability, but you could certainly imagine mass producing things that implement small patchwork lattice clusters and then they're unified together in exactly the same way as I've described here. Yeah, Alexei? Um, we haven't done too much work on robustness, no. That, that, although that, that, that concept is, that is another one of the reasons I'm generally critical of QKD is that they're much more vulnerable to denial of service attacks than any other type of classical encryption uh, because the network is far more sparse and has far less redundancy. Um, I've only thought about it in that sense. I haven't uh, explicitly tried to, to model any of this, no. Sort of, if you look at the IBM roadmap, they've got sort of in the next three, uh, several years having 
uh, multiple dyes with their cells and which which one needs. And then you have this question, which is more a sort of things which are close to each other with surface polygons on them. Can you then be, uh, they get the two fault tolerance and things like that? Yeah, that that seems like exactly the type of architectural design I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, obviously, they're, they're, they're not talking about those interconnects being long distance ones, but it's exactly the same sort of modularization. Yeah. And, and it does raise other interesting questions, because if you've, you've got this unified lattice, we've got two different types of errors going on. There are the, there are the errors at the level of the long distance interconnects, which are some of the edges in the cluster state. And then there are the ones within nodes, which have much lower error rates. Um, so the question is, what's the best way to then make that fault tolerant where we've got these asymmetries, a small number of the links are much more expensive and error prone than the ones inside nodes. Um, that's an open question too. 